And I do want to encourage you, uh, not because... The message was good in any way, but just because of the content of the message, uh, this past Sunday we did speak on the first 16 verses of chapter 11. There's some really uh, important um, information that we put out in that message in order to understand what Paul is speaking about here. So we're going to try to cover some of that as well, but if you have not listened to Sunday morning's uh, service. I would encourage you to go back and do that just so you, this gives you a better, especially after tonight, if you have some questions about it. And I'll be glad to talk with you about it as well. But it, it will help you to understand what Paul was trying to get across in these uh, verses here. I do want to lay the groundwork before we read it as well that Paul's big concern for the Corinthian church was that there were divisions that were uh, happening within the church. Paul's, he had two main goals that he shares in 1 Corinthians. One is that he might lead however many he can to a saving grace in Jesus Christ. And secondly, that there would be no distraction from glorifying God. So as he talks about here, especially starting chapter 11 and going for the next couple of chapters, he talks about the church meeting time or church service, if you, we want to call it that, and he talks about ways that they can prevent glory from being taken away from God. And sometimes that happens unintentionally in our church services. And um, it's not that we want to do that, it's just the way it happens. But in our church meeting times, what we do should be pointing people toward God. If they are unsaved, it should be pointing them toward a saving grace in Jesus Christ. If people are saved, hopefully they are, then we'll be pointing them toward glorifying God and what they do and worshiping Him. If things happen within the service that distract from that, then we've missed the goal of what we set out to do. So Paul, as he speaks in chapter 11 is he is trying to lay the groundwork for this young church, because again, they have not been in existence for very long. Also very young believers. He's trying to lay the groundwork so that they know not to pull attention away from God and place it on themselves, but to divert all attention they can unto God. So as we read this, kind of think through that as we go. Verse 1 of chapter 11. Verse 1 really kind of ties together with the prior verses in chapter 10, but Paul says, Be imitators of me as I am, as I am of Christ. And you got to go back to verse 33 to really grasp what he's talking about there. And Paul says in verse 33, Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. And then he says, If this is what I'm trying to do, I want you to imitate me because that means you will tr be trying to get individuals saved as well. And then verse 2 of chapter 11. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain in the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. That's an interesting statement, by the way, that we'll look at in a moment. Verse 11, Nevertheless, in the Lord woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman, for as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. 
Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Uh, kind of hard to get a memory verse out of that section, something that would stick with you, but verse 16 would be the one that, that I would point you to if you're looking for one in that. Uh, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Now let's, uh, let's back up to uh, the beginning of chapter 11 to verse 2, and let's start with verse 2 and, and kind of talk forward from there. So Verse 2 says, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. What did Paul thank the people for in verse 2 of chapter 11? Two things. Number one, that they kept traditions. And secondly, or vice versa, that would actually be number two. First one is... Remembering him. Yeah. Why was he thankful that they remembered him? It wasn't just because he didn't want to be forgotten, by the way. But if they remembered him, what did that mean that they remembered? His teachings, what he had taught them. The importance that he had in their life as they began as a young church to grow. And so they had not forgotten what Paul had come and taught them. It was important for Paul. Secondly, he was thankful that they maintained the traditions. Now, what traditions would he be talking about? Would he be talking about that they sang three, four verses, and then they had a sermon, and then they prayed, and then they went home? Is that the traditions that he would be thankful that they... They kept the, uh, there's a lot of traditions today that go on. Some of them are not necessarily biblical traditions, but they are generational traditions. So that's what the generation did before us. We mimic it because it's what we've saw or learned. And until, <clears throat> until we decide to establish a different tradition, then it continues on. You have traditions in your own life, probably around Christmas time, something that you do with your family may be traditional. You may have went to this grandparent on Christmas Eve or this grandparent on Christmas Day, and those are traditions, and then at some point those change, right? Not that you want them to, but sometimes they do. In church, we, we establish some traditions as well. Uh, through the whole COVID time, some of those got broken. Uh, we realized, though, how important it was for us to come together because we tried to... Um, do online to try and fill kind of a gap there, but, but yet it's not the same as coming together, is it? it? No, it's not. Y'all can go ahead and say that. No, it's not the same, okay? It's not the same as coming together. So we found out that the tradition of coming together, which we're also commanded that is an important thing to do, but we also found out that it's an important thing to do as well. Now, the tradition of singing four, three, four songs, whatever, then have a sermon and going out. That's not necessarily biblical. But it's what we've chosen to do over the course of time. Coming together and sharing God's Word and leaning upon each other, praying together, that is absolutely biblical. It's there. Here's something that I've often wondered what would happen if we done. What if one Sunday morning I walk in and instead of having our song leader, whoever it may be, come up and start leading us music, what if I said, let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and we're going to preach first and we'll sing afterwards? Well, when I brought that up this morning, they said, you know, we'd probably sing the first and last verse of every song after that because they'd get out early if they'd done that. Someone said they'd probably speed the songs up a little bit too, so I don't know. Some people would miss out because they could end up first late. Uh, yeah. So when you sing first, it gives everybody time to get in and get settled. 
Yeah. So that's why we sing first, right? So people have time to be late. Typically, the music helps us do that if we're paying attention to the words, right? What if we're just singing them because it's a song that has a great tune and we like the song? Or, man, it has a great bass line or alto lead, and so it sounds really good. Is that really why we come together? Does it really help us get into what Miss Jody just talked about? Or is it just something that we've done traditionally? can be both. Um, so ideally, the music does lead us to a, a time of when we focus ourselves more upon the word. Um, you know, in past, what they would have sung, even in Paul's time, what they would have been singing would actually would have been the Psalms, and they would have sung those. Uh, it wouldn't be the songs that we sing today. Um, but over the course of time, those things have changed doesn't mean, mean that the songs we sing today are wrong. doesn't mean that the songs they sang then are wrong. It just means that it's changed over time. Uh, we also have Sunday school prior to church, right? Is that prescribed anywhere in the Word? That Sunday school is to be before church? Is Sunday school prescribed at all? Study of the Word. Study of the Word is, yeah. Gathering together is. Anybody know how Sunday school actually got started? Everybody looks to Eddie. That's funny. That is funny. Eddie, we miss you when you're not here. I just want you to know. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, does anyone know how Sunday school got started, or why it got started? I read it, but I don't remember. So, there was uh, an older man that realized that there were children that needed to learn to read. And so, he began meeting with children before church, and he used the Bible to teach them how to read. That's the early beginnings of Sunday school. Okay. Sunday school is really not that old of a, when you consider the age of the New Testament church, it's really not that old of an institution. It goes back about 150, 200 years now, Sunday school does. It's not a bad thing, right? It's a good thing. We come together, we study, but over the course of time, tradition kind of brought it to where it is today. And back when it started, most, most of the churches were also in the school building. Exactly right. That's right. So uh, some of these things develop over time. What Paul is saying, though, is he's thankful that they kept the tradition, the traditions that he taught them that were important from God. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about some of the surface traditions that just happen in church and develop over time. He's talking about what he taught them that as a church they needed to do. One of the things probably would have been coming together in communion, which he speaks of here shortly. Um, and that would have been one of the traditions that he would have been thankful that they remembered to do. One of the things I've heard a couple of generations ago in this church that clapping was something you would do. Would or would not? Would not, would not do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you see that in a lot of churches. Some churches did, some didn't. And it changes over time sometimes. So. All right. Um, so we've answered one and two. Question three, what did the Christian faith bring to women, children, and slaves that they did not have before? So this is kind of looking at Paul's overall teaching here. And what is he having to deal with as this, this Corinthian church had sent a letter to him asking him questions about some things that were kind of issues within the church. So what is it that the Christian faith have brought to women, children, and slaves that they did not have in their previous culture or religion. I'm sorry. Hope. 
It did bring hope. What else did it bring? It brought them the word. Yeah, and brought them the word. Of, of God's direction for them. Okay. Okay. Their father, who was, or their dad, mm -hmm. husband. What else did it bring to them? What was the word you just said? Starts with an E. It brought them equality. Before they were not able to pray, prophesy, as Paul mentions here in a group of people. In fact, in the Jewish synagogue, they would sit in an area behind, if you want to call it a veil or a curtain, they would be separate from the men of the church. Uh, boys, if I, understand, if I remember right, boys under the age of 13 would actually sit with them. Once they turned 13, they would sit with their dad because they would reach that age that they considered to be manhood. So you found that, that women really were not, especially in some other cultures too, not just Jewish, but they were not respected. They were not on an equal valued plane. Now that doesn't mean that they done everything that the male done, and it doesn't mean that the male done everything that the female done either. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But it did bring equality, it brought hope, it brought them understanding of God's Word because now they were able to, to actually hear, interact, and ask questions, you know, even. So, um, it was huge to them. This is where Christianity gets a bad name and a wrong name because Christianity has always been equality for all people. Because as God creates us, He doesn't create one person more valuable than another. He creates us all equal and loved by Him. Therefore, Christianity and the Christian faith, understanding God and His purpose, is understanding that each one of us are just as important. And that doesn't matter if we're Muslim, it doesn't matter if we're black, it doesn't matter if we're white, it doesn't matter what color, what language we speak, or anything else, we are all equally important when we look in God's eyes. And that's what Christianity brought to um, this culture at that point in time. Now, it's a change. So it's a change of mindset for the people, even those that were in the New Testament church. And remember, this is an early young church in spiritual age. So their understanding of this is still growing. And so it means that there were some difficulties that they had to work through. Look at uh, question four. Why was it troubling? And why was Paul addressing? <clears throat> so why was it troubling the women not having their head covered in a church meeting? Why was that an issue? And why is he bringing this up here? Number one, we assume there was a, a question or a comment in the letter that came to him concerning this, but why is he dealing with it? They were part of the culture and then bringing it into the church, they had to address it. You might have to be completely off, but probably had to be addressed with the church members and saying this is the house of God, not the house of you know, the leader of the congregation. Yeah. So if you look into culture, <clears throat> and you go into some of the temples where um, prostitution occurred, the women there would have their heads shaved or very short hair. So if someone that becomes Christian faith or is just exploring the Christian faith and walks into church with these young believers, because remember, one of Paul's goals is we do not bring attention to ourselves, but we point attention to God, right? So in everything that we do, we point to God, we don't point to self. So if someone walks in, a woman walks in with her head shaved or very short hair, it's not covered, what's the thought in the culture at that point in time? So where do you think everybody's looking? So where is attention then? On her or on God? brought to her. So what does Paul say? Because Paul doesn't say, okay, she's not allowed to come to church until her hair grows out. Does he? Not what he says. What does he say? He says, they should cover their head. Cover their head. You don't bring, you're not a distraction at that point. You're not taking attention away from God because of culture. 
This is what needs to occur in order for there not to be division in the church, in order for all attention to be devoted unto God. So you remove the distraction, which means talking about this whole Christian liberty thing that we've talked about here in the last few chapters or weeks, that means that these women that maybe have become saved, and once they become saved, their hair doesn't automatically grow like that, right? It takes time. But they, they may be coming out of that former lifestyle, so it takes a while for the hair to grow out. So Paul says, we want you to come to church. We want you to be a part of it. Just cover your head, come to church. You're not a distraction. You're a part of the church then. Everybody's fine. So Paul is, again, trying to teach them. Let's point attention to God. Let's remove distractions, but let's welcome people in. Because the only way that they're going to grow is by being associated with the church. Any questions on that? Okay, in order for peace to, in the church to exist, question five. What does there need to be? In order for peace in the church to exist, what does there need to be? Unity. Unity. Okay. Someone said something else. Unity. Unity. Harmony. Was that what, as well? Yeah. What else? Those are right. But what else? Love for your neighbor. Love for your neighbor. Absolutely. What else? Think about what Paul's writing here. What do you see him writing about? Focus on Christ. Yep. What else do we see here? All those are right. Every one of them. But what else do we see here that Paul identifies? Respect. Respect. Absolutely. So something that unites together, kind of a common bond. Okay. In this time, communication and education. Communication and education; those are two things that they needed as well. What about structure? How many of you like disorderly church services? Do you love it when chaos exists? Or do you like to know that when you walk in church, these things are going to happen? I know the answer. Y'all just got to be honest here. Because I learned through COVID. I knew it before, but I learned through COVID. Y'all don't like disorderly stuff. No one does in church. You like things to be orderly. It's actually prescribed by text. All things should be done decently and orderly. What does Paul prescribe here? When you look at, at this text... Notice what he says. When he begins speaking about Christ, who does he say is the head of Christ? God. Who is the head of man? Christ. Who is the head of woman? Y'all were louder on that one for some reason. What is that? Is that not structure? Good orderly direction. Orderly direction. Some type of structure. God designed this world with structure. When you think about how we worship, there's structure in what we do. There's a reason that we do the things that we do, because there's structure behind it. When we talked about our service earlier and we sing first, it's not just so late people can come in and still hear the word. It is actually because it does set the tone for, and it gets our heart, it gets our mind hopefully focused upon what we're about to read and study in God's word. And hopefully through that time, we begin worshiping God as well. Now, Paul prescribes this structure or reminds them of this structure because he says, in order for the church to exist without division, without problem, and it to exist orderly, there needs to be structure. And God established this structure. Does that mean that one piece of the structure is much better than another? It actually means that they're equally important. We talked a few moments ago about during COVID when we did not come together as church. We were still a church, but we didn't come together as church. 
we removed a piece of that structure because remember, God's Word prescribes that we do come together, right? Prescribes that we meet together, we assemble together. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's a piece of the structure that God put in place because He knows we need that, right? So when we took that piece of structure out, even though we were trying to do the online stuff, we took that piece of structure out. What happened? Did we struggle? We lost direction. We, we in some ways lost direction and it was, a, it was a challenge to try and keep that focus. Some people struggle. We find to, even today some people are not back in church yet. We also find that even as we come back to church, like it took us a little while to kind of get back into like the structure of the feel of things, right? And what our direction really is. So we find that all pieces of structure are important. What does God prescribe as He creates things when He gets to the seventh day? Rest. Day of rest. Do you think that's just because God wanted to rest after six days of work? Do you think that could be part of God's designed structure because He knows that we need that in our life? You see, there's not, God doesn't do just random things. There's a structure, there's a reason for everything that He does, and it's for our benefit. Therefore, as he talks about this day that we set aside, you know, when we come into church, what should we be coming with the mindset to do? Worship God. What do we come with the mindset of? You know, someone said this morning if the pot roast was going to burn or not. <laughs> That was the we eat cereal, right? You don't have to worry about burning the pot roast that way. Don't we come to church sometimes with everything on our mind except what we are supposed to be coming to church to do? Why is that? Have we failed to recognize the structure that God put in place for our benefit? Kind of got out of order here a little bit, but look at question six. What's the difference between a manager and an entry-level employee? Or what's the difference between a captain and a private in an army? Authority and experience. Someone this morning also said education, which I th thought was a good observation. What else is, is there anything else different? Is there anything that's the same? Both a person, both equally important, aren't they? What, could you imagine if you had a whole army of captains? What would happen? I'm sorry. Maturity, Maturity yep, plays in as well. Think about uh, what if you had a whole workforce of just managers? You'd get in a room and you'd all look at each other and you'd talk about what was going to happen and then nothing would happen, right? You have to have somebody that's in charge that gives the orders and then the, the other people, the workers, are the ones that fill the orders. So there has to be somebody that's in charge and then someone that's under control. Which one's more important? Both are both the same. Both. My grandmother used to say, too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Yeah. So you are part of the old group. They said it this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what that all sounds like that we just said? Structure in a church. It also sounds like structure in a family. Because if everyone in the family was in charge, what would happen? Chaos. Chaos. So can you see that God prescribed an order within the church and also within the family for a reason? Does that mean that one in that order is more important than the other? They are both equally important. 
And we should never forget that. Because if we forget that, then we're operating outside of God's created order, which means we are saying your order is not good. Both have to exist, but there's a need for both. Is there a structure or an order to the New Testament church today? There is, isn't there? And there are a reason that we have like pastors and we have deacons and we have trustees and we have Sunday school teachers and we have people that, you know, all the other committees, I don't want to try to name them all, but all the other committees that we have. And there are a reason we have those. Is any one of those any more important than the other? No. They all fit a role though, right? They all have a purpose and they all operate in that structure. And when that structure is respected, things go well, and it's decent, and it's orderly. But when we start trying to get outside of that, that's when things really start kind of getting wrong. So there's a reason that God prescribed these things. Look at um, question eight. Look at John chapter 10. And then we'll flip over to John chapter 14 in a minute. But John chapter 10, verse 30. Talking about structure, Christ himself speaks or talks of this structure as well. Now, this is a case where if we take one piece of a verse out of context, then we can make Scripture say what we want it to say sometimes, which is not right. It is totally wrong to do. That's why it's so important to look at the context of Scripture. And what we look at, are looking at in 1 Corinthians 11, it's important to look in the context of that, right? Because otherwise we're going to walk around and tell every woman that's here, y'all got to cover your heads. And that's not right. I mean, that's, that's not what Paul was saying. So, looking at John chapter 10, verse 30, we find Christ speaking, and Christ says, I and the Father are one. What do we know that that verse means? Part of the Trinity, absolutely, which means they are like what? <coughs> Like-minded in, in everything. I and the Father are one. Now, that verse is used out of context by some religions to try and go against the Trinity, to say that there's not a Trinity because Christ is saying that I and the Father are one. That's not what Christ is speaking about. Flip over to John chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 28. Christ is speaking to the apostles before He departs from them. And in verse 28, He says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send... In my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Now verse 28, you heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father." You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Obviously, speaking of two different individuals here, right? Is he saying here that God is better than him or more important than him? What does the word greater actually mean there? Or let's take this in context. What is Jesus speaking to the apostles about? What is Jesus speaking to the apostles about? 
If you love me, you would have rejoiced because of what? Because he's staying here on earth where it's sin filled? Because he's going back to where he came from. If you love me, Father has the mo Father has authority, possibly has the most authority, although the Son is the only one that is worthy to open the scroll. Is God more important than Christ? There's three of them. Yeah. And we say this, they're all equally important, right? What is Christ speaking to the apostles about here? Christ was, when Christ left heaven, left his place with God, did he give up some things? Did he give up a place that was sin filled? Or did he give up a place that was sinless? And he came to a place that's sin filled, right? To live among fallen man. Christ has been trying to prepare his apostles and say, look, I'm about to go back. But what did the, did the apostles want him to leave? No. So what does Christ say to them? If you really love me, what would you want me to do? Stay here in this sin or go back to where it's sinless? I'm saying that to mean a broad term of things, but you know what I mean when I say that, right? So if they really loved him, they would want him to go back to the right hand of the Father where he sits even today. So Christ is saying, not that God is greater than me in terms of importance or in terms of value, but he's saying that he sits in a greater place right now. He has a role. Christ also has a role, right? Is Christ's role important? Yeah. Absolutely Every one of you should say amen to that because like we experience grace because of that, don't we? So Christ is not saying God's greater than me. Christ is saying God is living in a place that is greater than the place that we're living in right now. And he is in a greater, um, he is enjoying greater things at this point in time. God had a role it was to stay there and to send his son to come and fill the role that Christ had. Now his time, Christ's time, well, soon would be, his time was to go back to that place that was great. When we think of this in terms of the order in which the church operates, there are certain places, positions that look as though they may be more important than others. But are they? No. It is, it, this is why we say, and I hope you believe this and you know this, when you're not here, you are missed because you play a role in the church. So we miss you not being here. Now, is it more apparent if I'm gone versus someone that, that sits in a pew? It's more noticeable, right? But it's still just as important for the individual that's sitting in the pew to be here as it is for me to be here. I just play a different role. So do you. But it's equally important for you to be here. That's why this church operates in the order that it does, and it's able to operate that way. So this teaches us that submission for the sake of order is extremely important. Christ submitted to God's will, came to this earth, and fulfilled what he was supposed to do. It was submission on his part. In the same way that when you become a part of a church, this one or any other, you submit yourselves to the structure of that church. And at some point in time, you may fit into a different slot in that structure than what you fit right now. But eventually, you fit importantly, especially if you join, you fit importantly into that structure. 
So Christ is teaching his apostles that there's a proper place for him to be. And if they loved him, then they would want him to be in that place. You all with me? Aren't we like the apostles, brother Kevin, whenever we have loved ones that go into a better place, but we don't want them, we, well, we don't want them to go. We're selfish, you know. Even though we know they're going to be in a lot better place and not go through the heartache and stuff that we're still going through right now. But we just, we don't want them to go, no matter what. It's a... Uh... Yeah. Maybe you know they're thinking the same thing. We're selfish. No, we want you here with us. You know, even though we, we should be rejoicing you're going, we should be rejoicing with our loved ones going, but we just don't want, we don't turn loose. I will say it was a little bit different in what Christ was speaking because he was going back to fulfill a role that was now his at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. So if they really loved him they would want him to go fill that role. So a little bit different, but yes, the same mentality of if we know they're going to a place that, um, if we know they're going to heaven, just to, in short terms, if we know they're going to heaven, then uh, we should rejoice in that. But we do miss them. And, um, and there's, it's not wrong for us to miss them. We just have to, under, we have to balance that as well. All right, look at um, question nine. Notice in Jewish law, Numbers chapter five, what happened to a woman who was proved to be guilty of adultery? We're not going to go and read it. I'll let you read it later. I hope you will. But what happened to a woman who was proven to be guilty of adultery? Okay, prior to stoning. You are right. But prior to that. had something to do with her head. They didn't cut it off. But what did they cut off? They shaved her head. Jewish, right? Does Paul have Jews in this New Testament, First Corinthian church? What are they hanging on to? Some of them hanging on to? The old ways, which meant woman walks in with shaved head. What is the automatic assumption? They've been caught in adultery somewhere, therefore their heads shake. Paul also informs that while women came from man to begin with, Eve from the rib of Adam, where does he say that man now comes from and what does this mean in this discussion? So where does man now come from? Woman, right? So what does that mean about female male? Are we dependent upon each other? Upon each other? Absolutely. Actually, the best term would be interdependent. We are interdependent upon each other. Uh, and God prescribed it that way. That's the structure that God established. I'm moving quickly because we're out of time. From verse 10, what does Paul imply is present during the church meeting? So look at verse 10, and then we'll answer the rest of it. Verse 10 says, that is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. What does Paul imply is present at church meeting? Angels. Have you ever thought about that? That the angels are present when we gather together for church, worship, Does that change anything about the way we approach worship? Look at Isaiah. I'm going to read it for you, but Isaiah chapter 6, for sake of time. Isaiah chapter 6 is where Isaiah gets his call from God. But verse 2 of that, I'm going to start in verse 1 and read for you. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is where Isaiah kind of explains what he sees in the throne room of God. Verse 2, above him stood the seraphim. Now what's a seraphim? An angel, right? Each seraphim had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. What did the angel do with his face in the presence of God? He covered it. Does this thought enter our mind when we meet for worship service that there is a tremendous amount of respect that we should have as we come together? If the angels, if the angels cover their face when they worship the Lord, does that change the way we think about our worship service? Or should it change the way we think about our worship service? But instead, what do we come to church with our mind on? Pot roast. Or whatever else that we have to do that afternoon. And in What's that? Or what someone is wearing. Or what someone is wearing. Or a list of other things, right? But if the angels cover their face, isn't this worship that we do something that should be extremely serious and important? Now, does that mean that we never have, when I say a good time, does that mean that we never smile in church? Does it mean that we never laugh in church? It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that when we come together, we don't put attention toward ourselves, but we put attention toward God. I would encourage you to think about some things that happen that can bring attention toward ourselves instead of God. And you may have things that float through your mind right now, but there are things that occur some of them may actually be acts of Satan or his demons to try and distract from what's going on. Some of them may just be that we don't have our mind where it needs to be. It may not be Satan acting in any way. It may just be fallen flesh. But we do need to have a reverence when we come before. If the angels are covering their face, I'm pretty sure we need to have a respect of what we're doing. And then lastly, verse, uh, question 12 from verse 17, which I don't think I read. Look at verse 17 if you would real quick. Because we want to book in verse 2 with verse 17 on this section. It says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. What did Paul do in verse 2? praised them or commended, to use the word, he commended them for what they were doing right, right? They remembered him, what he taught them. They also remember the traditions. What is he doing in verse 17? Is he commending them? Yeah, but, but I think he said rebuking and, and getting on to kind of the same line of thought there. Okay, so if Paul is coming to them and saying, two things that you're doing great. Notice if you read down verse 18, Paul is now saying, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. And then notice in verse 18, he says, for in the first place, now he begins talking about the things that they are not doing well. Now, if you identify that there's a first place, that means that there's probably what? A second place. And if you read on down, there's more than a second place. 
Is it necessary for us to lift up people when we come together in the body of Christ? Is it also necessary for us to point out things that may need to change within our life that would bring us more in line with Christ's life? Or His desire for our life? We find it prescribed in text, don't we? Why would we say that that's wrong? What is it that we want, though, today? What is it that we... Acceptance. Acceptance of what we're doing. What is it that we remember the most? Do we remember when someone encourages me and says, I want to commend you because you remember me in everything and you maintain the traditions? Do you think they remembered that more? Or do you think they remembered, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you? Which one do you think stuck in their mind most? The last one. Why is it that we remember the negatives more? <laughs> because we don't like on human nature, we tend to focus on the negative, right? So sometimes we walk out of church and we say, man, all they've done was just get on to me today. Hopefully, in service, you're going to hear somewhere along the way a word of encouragement. But do we always walk out of here remembering that? No, because we focus on the negative. Now, what some um, places have done is decided that all we're going to do is uplift people. And they've walked away from correction or instruction. Is that what Paul prescribes here? No. no. If you need to know what you're doing wrong, that way you know what you need to work on, what you need to correct. But that also doesn't mean that we never give encouragement either. So we have to do both. And Paul does that here. We find that as parents, too. As parents, if you're always negative on your kid, it doesn't work out well. But if you're always positive and you never give instruction, what happens? They become spoiled brats, don't they? Do you think we have spoiled brats in church sometimes? <laughs> Alan's shaking his head no. <laughs> Alan, meet me in my office. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I think it's really important for us to note that, that Paul does identify, yes, we encourage people, but yes, we also speak to them about what needs to be corrected. In a loving manner. In a loving manner but we shouldn't walk out of here saying, man, I never want to go back because all I've done was felt bad about what was said. In some way, we should consider that love. If Paul didn't love them, would he be talking to them about these things? No, he wouldn't care, but he loves them. Yeah. It is growth. It brings growth. It brought about growth. This isn't when you teach a child math or whatever. You're going to have to correct the first time they do it, but they're growing each time with the correction as it's growing to know and learn more. And so it has to be that. Right. It is. It is. And uh, sometimes it hits us harder. And sometimes we have to pray about it. We have to digest it. We have to study it ourselves. Because we may walk out here and say, well, I don't agree with that. But that should never be the end of the discussion. In some way, either we need to go dive in and research, or we need to come back and have a discussion about what we've heard. Yeah. If it's coming from you or a fellow Christian or whatever, you know, I like to hear that. One of the things we talked about this morning was like sometimes you hear something from a pulpit that convicts. And sometimes the best thing that can happen after that is someone from among the body walks along beside and says, you know, 
That used to be something going on in my life too, but I realized that God's Word actually speaks against it. And so it's an encouragement from an individual within the body of Christ that walks along beside them and says, hey, I know what you heard. It used to be something I struggled with as well. And I want you to know that this is what God's Word says. And so it reinforces what's going on. tragedy. And uh, all because he felt like he had never been disciplined, never corrected. The one I could tell what time I was wrestling that he was the truth. He got, to do <laughs> he got to do anything he wanted to do. Parents didn't say anything to him. You know, isn't it true that, I'll say this and then we're going, I'm sure. Um, isn't it true that kids like structure? You think, uh, do you think God designed that? Yes. So why as adults do we fight against structure so much? Is it because we now know better than a child does? Because sometimes it's the inconvenience. Ah. The inconvenience is us to keep our kids in a structure. Like, I'll use an example. When my grandchildren take naps, even in the summer, Somebody will call and say, hey, do you want to do lunch or whatever? And I'll say, well, I can go at this time, but I can't go at this time because this is nap time. They're like, seriously, can you not skip a nap? No. <laughs> you cannot skip a nap. Look, but it's just Alan gets cranky when he skips a nap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, it, but I mean, it, it, because we found that if we miss a nap, then it's just chaos. Like, we're going, it's just chaos. So, but, it, but it does take not going to lunch or not going to jump or running around and saying, I have to be back by this time because it's nap time. Like, I've actually had people I do want to answer this one question. It didn't come up tonight. It did this morning, though. And so I want to answer that. Um, someone said, so if in the church all people are equal, there's a structure, but people are equal, why is it that women cannot be deacons? So if Paul is conveying a structure where people are equal, why is it that women cannot be deacons? If you flip over to Timothy, you also find when he talks about those who are supposed to be elders in the church, he speaks of men being elders in the church. So it is God prescribed instruction. Again, God prescribes structure within a church, and there's a reason behind that. So the church doesn't just do things, and I'm not talking about just this one, I'm talking about the church. The church doesn't just do things because on a whim we decide to do them. We do them because there is a structure from the Bible that we follow. And it's important that we do because just like a little child, we are little children in the spiritual side and we need structure in our life. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We thank you for this time you've given us to look to your word. Lord, we pray that in all ways uh, your word was communicated accurately. And if not, Lord, we pray that you bring it to our attention. So Lord, we ask for your blessings upon what we do. But Lord, we ask as we depart from here that we would be 
your messengers to go forth and to help the world around us to know you and also to point them toward you and point glory toward you, not taking it upon ourselves, but pointing it in the direction of you. Lord, we thank you for the structure that you have established in our lives. But Lord, we pray also that we remember that every person is valuable and we should treat them in that way. We thank you for your son and we thank you that he desired to go back and to fill his place or his role and that he serves even now so that we can talk to you. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray it all in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. All right. Uh, Just in case for the information about Sunday School class, it's uh, 270 years. It was uh, started in 1761 by William King. Okay, there you go. So 270 years. So about three, almost 300 years ago. I was a little off on the years. But anyway, y'all have a good evening. Uh, if you are interested in the mission trip to Jamaica, we'll meet right here in just a couple minutes.